um, very thankful for a cool place to gather. And um, why don't we open with prayer and we'll jump in. We're on part nine of Turning Points, so let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your blessings. Thank you for your good gifts, Lord. You are so kind to us that we have health and strength that we can be here today. Um, Lord, that is a gift. And uh, we presume sometimes that because um, we are feeling good for so long that that will just continue. And yet it doesn't. Uh, we still live with the effects of the curse. And uh, Father, we thank you that uh, you give us grace and sustain us and help us so that uh, we are able to be here today. Uh, that is a gift and we give you thanks, Lord. Thank you for your blessing uh, that you give us from your word by the power of your spirit. We pray that you would feed our souls and uh, that you would please refresh us and, and sharpen us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jerry Williamson passed away at age 97. He did, just this spring, right? Or was it April, fall? April, April yeah. yeah. He did, G.I. Williamson. Uh, very uh, influential father of the faith in the OPC, especially his writings on the Westminster Confession and uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism for kids and other things. So uh, we, our time is, I mean, he didn't have a short breath. He, you know, God gave him 90 plus years. Um, but that's unusual, right? Uh, but that does, God is gracious in his own sovereign plans. And, and I'm sure Mr. Pastor Williamson was a blessing to the church as well. Well, speaking of the church, we're continuing our series on the history of Presbyterianism. And uh, we are in part nine today. Part nine is entitled The Special Commission of 1925. So this kind of gives you an idea of where we're at in the timeline. And I mentioned, I think, a week or two ago, or in passing, that, uh, you know, in many ways we look around us today and we see, wow, this is a really challenging season in the culture and for Christians in the United States. And uh, there are reasons to be very concerned, obviously, uh, with the culture and the state of just general moral, uh, the moral climate or lack thereof. And so, um, so we have reasons for concern today. Uh, and yet, I think if you really wanted to find probably the most, uh, the most terrible decade uh, for a confessional Protestant Christian, I think that probably the most terrible decade would have been 100 years ago in the 1920s, more than the 2020s. Um, and not because, again, things are so wonderful today, but in the 1920s, we saw the culmination of about 50 years worth of false doctrine and heresy working its way into the church. And, um, and so it really, we saw the influences of heresy uh, you know, and the church's inability to, to get rid of heresy, to discipline it. And we see the heresy kind of took down a significant part of the church. So in the 1920s, you had, uh, it, for Presbyterians, again, God had blessed Presbyterianism in the United States significantly from a start of just, a, you know, what, 40 churches at the early 1700s to now thousands, tens of thousands of churches when 1900s rolled around. Uh, many, many institutions. Remember, there was pressure to join with the Congregationalists in, um, in the 1800s because we didn't have a seminary, and they did. You know, they had Harvard and Yale and others, and um, we saw that that actually hurt us. But now there are so many Presbyterian seminaries established. There's Princeton, of course. There's, and then the other seminaries started to go bad. Uh, but there was, we're going to read about Union Theological Seminary in New York. There, there was a good Union Seminary uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line, right? There were Presbyterian seminaries in Texas that were relatively solid. There were many, many 
colleges and universities and seminaries that were great. And yet, by the 1920s, we saw many of them succumbing to the, the spirit of the age and heresy and abandoning the faith. Now, they didn't just shut their doors and say, you know, we're closing up. What they did is they redefined the faith. And that was the heresy of, again, lack of authority of the scripture. And then that impacted uh, what the church taught on the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus, the reality of the resurrection. Um, did Jesus, did his death really have any uh, saving import on us? Um, all those critical questions and answers were abandoned. And so we see Presbyterian churches and ministries en masse not shutting their doors in the 1920s, but redefining what it meant to be a Christian and departing from the historic Christian faith. So they were still thinking that, hey, we're Presbyterians. We heard last week that there was a movement to, we need to get with the times, right? Uh, there's progress all around us in the culture. There's progress in science, the scientific method. There's progress in social sciences. And we need to change the, these core identities so that we stay relevant to the changing time. So we saw there's this movement to update Presbyterianism, but update it in a way that was really unhelpful, in fact, terrible. So we saw that that was the movement between last week's part nine, the confessional revisions in 1903, right? So the 1903, the Presbyterian Church kind of modified the confessions to make it more acceptable to the spirit of the age. But they didn't modify the confession enough in 1903 to make it a heresy. You still have the Westminster Standards as kind of holding down, putting stakes in the ground and saying, this is biblical Christianity. What happened was, as the 1900s unfolded after 1903, we saw these Presbyterian institutions, churches, seminaries, mission boards, um, basically abandoning the content of the Westminster Standards and yet not being honest about it. So they were redefining the terms of the Westminster Standards. So for example, the Westminster Standards clearly says that Jesus rose from the dead being vindicated by the Father as the righteous one and and now his literal bodily resurrection was not only his vindication, but we will share in his vindication on, on the last day when we will be raised and we will be ushered into God's glory presence, vindicated, righteous. It's a big deal. The Presbyterians of 100 years ago were saying, you know what, we know that science says nobody can be raised from the dead. So when the Bible talks about Jesus being raised from the dead, that didn't literally happen. So what they said is, this is all figurative. His spirit lives on. The spirit of Jesus continues, inspiring people. So in that sense, the, the apostate Presbyterian said, the resurrection of Jesus continues. His spirit lives on, and he continues to inspire Another way that they uh, walked away from the faith was saying, you know what, the whole idea about Jesus being crucified and his blood turning aside the wrath of God against our sins. That's so barbaric, they would say. You know, having someone's blood shed, it sounds like the volcano gods of the Pacific Ocean, you know, and they, they throw in young virgins to appease the, the, the volcano gods. That's kind of what the cross sounds like, these apostate Presbyterians said. So what they said was, Jesus may have been crucified. You know, he was killed by the Romans and the Jewish mob, but it didn't result in our salvation. Our sins were not imputed to Christ, and he wasn't our substitute. Instead, what they said was... Um, you know, that his, his crucifixion happened, but it wasn't saving. The real value of Jesus, the apostate Presbyterian said, isn't in his 
substitutionary death, the atonement, isn't his resurrection bodily, his vindication. They said the value of Jesus isn't what he did, but in what he said. It's the teachings of Jesus. And so the apostate Presbyterians like to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, and they even distorted that. They said the Sermon on the Mount is all about how you need to be nice. You know, you've got to be, you've got to be like Jesus. You've got to live like Jesus. What was the number one bestseller in the early 20th century? Um, far and away sold more than any book in a period of decades. Uh, it was, I should know the author, I'm not spitballing here, but it was uh, called In His Steps. And what In His Steps was all about, it sold millions of copies back in the early 1900s. So this was a huge hit. Uh, it was by Sheldon, I think. Sheldon's in his steps. And anyway, it was all about what would, it was WWJD, what would Jesus do? So it was all about the teachings and the moral life of Jesus. And that is really the heart of the Christian faith. You know, it's, it's being nice, it's living like Jesus. And, and so, so I'm giving you, trying to give you a sense of what was going on a hundred years ago. That too, and we've got the twenties and people kind of saying, hey, live, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. So you've got the flappers, uh, just uh, promiscuity, just taking over uh, American culture. So if you think that you know, marriage and family today is stressed, really huge stressors in the 1920s. Uh, so the cultural morality was being stretched and torn. Um, and then you've got this influx of Roman Catholics from Eastern and Southern Europe. The, the Protestants are saying, oh my goodness, we're gonna be following the Pope before you know it. Um, and so what do we do? So actually, the more, uh, a lot of the Protestants in the early 1900s said, we've got to make sure that all these immigrants are trained up to think like us. And so what they did is they, did, they imposed mandatory, compulsory public education rules. So if you were here, you had to send your kids to public schools where they would kind of be taught this generic, be nice Christianity, even though it wasn't Christianity. You know, but it was kind of ethically, be nice, treat people well. Jesus was a great teacher in some ways. So if you want to know who to blame for compulsory public school education, it's actually um, apostating Protestants uh, and evangelicals too, who are really worried about the Roman Catholic immigrant hordes that were gonna change the culture and following the Pope. Right, so. Uh, anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of these pressures in 1920s. That was easily the worst. So the 1920s, I think, were the worst decade because you had God's blessing in so many ways, and yet all these churches and institutions that were good were just being hollowed out and falling to apostasy, even though they weren't saying, oh, by the way, we're apostate. We're, they were still claiming you can be a good Presbyterian but they had abandoned the substance of the faith. Now you've heard last week, I think someone mentioned uh, J. Gresham Machen, Christianity and Liberalism. Uh, he wrote that, uh, I think 1920, 21, give or take a few years either way. Um, Note well, Machen was defining all this, the spirit of the age, liberal Christianity, apostate Christianity. And he was basically saying it's, they use the same terms, but they mean completely different things. It's a different religion. And that's why the title of the book is Christianity, what? And liberalism. They're two substantively different things, different religions. He studied Europe too, right? Machen studied in, in liberal Protestantism in, the, in Germany. Like Hodge, it was, it was like a second warning against uh, German high critical methodologies. He was very, Machen would deserve another couple of sessions on his own. So, in fact, maybe we should do that someday soon. Uh, Machen was a fascinating character. He, he was brilliant, 
uh, studied under the liberals and uh, eventually, and almost was persuaded, but he then said, you know, no, wait, this is a departure. And the more he meditated on the truth of the gospel and the Presbyterian uh, system, he said, yeah, no, higher criticism and modernism or liberalism is a different religion. And he tried to warn people and he gave great arguments for the truth as opposed to the apostate stuff that was being taught. So, okay, so that's not even in part nine. Questions or comments before we now kind of turn a corner and jump into part nine? So you're kind of tracking the context here, right? 1920s were terrible. You just saw so many losses. Even though today is kind of crummy in many ways, today we haven't fallen as far. We, we were lower baseline, <laughs> I mean, as a culture and as a church. So you know, the 2020s, American Christianity, God knows its strength and its weaknesses, but it's a far cry from what it was 100 years ago. 1920s, again, uh, you, you look at what uh, the commission to uh, to study and revise the Westminster Standards. Who was on the 15-member committee? You've got a former U.S. president and a sitting Supreme Court justice, among others. You know, the, the Presbyterian Church was a cultural juggernaut. Uh, and so it, it had a lot further to fall in the 1920s. Now we were already falling a long way in the 2020s. And so now, you know, we're, yeah, but anyway, so that's when my argument, the 1920s were probably worse than now, if that's any comfort. <laughs> Is that a good thing that's on you? No, that's just an historical argument, <laughs> but maybe. Um, all right, so now we talk about the special commission of 1925, right? So they start off, progressive Presbyterians were not content with the revisions to the Westminster Confession that were approved in 1903, right? There was more work to be done to bring the Presbyterian church into greater harmony with the modern world. And that's the spirit of the age that's kind of infecting not just the Presbyterian church, but it's influencing the Lutheran church, uh, the, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Disciples of Christ. I mean, every denomination is being influenced by these trends and this kind of apostasy, this modernism that Machen wrote about. So, um, yeah, we just see a lot of apostasy working through American Christianity. Okay, so the center of this progressive movement was in the Presbytery of New York. Can anything good come out of New York? The Presbytery of New York, um, that was pressing the liberal agenda on a few fronts. First, May 1922, Harry Emerson Fosdick, he was a Baptist pastor, but so this influences the Baptist church, but he was stated supply, he was called to regularly preach at First Presbyterian Church in the city of New York. Very big, prominent Presbyterian church in New York City. And he basically rallied liberals with his famous sermon, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And um, a year later, the Presbytery of New York, 1923, they took the provocative step of ordaining two graduates of Union Seminary in New York, New York Presbytery, who could not affirm the virgin birth of Christ. So these two graduates of Union said, you know what, we think that Jesus literally wasn't born of a virgin. Um, you know, that's scientifically impossible. And it's not a core element of the Christian faith. And they ordained them to ministry anyway. Now, again, there's a whole lot of stuff that comes with this denial of virgin birth also. So th these are people that have walked away from the faith, even though they are not, they're, they've apostatized, but they're not claiming that they have. Um, they're trying to save Christianity by gutting it and making it more acceptable to the spirit of the age. Okay, so in 1923, Presbyterian of New York, they ordained two ministers, recent grads, 
who deny the virgin birth of Christ, among other things. Even worse, the Presbytery of New York then convened a gathering in Auburn, New York, in December 1923, and it produced quote, an affirmation designed to safeguard the unity and liberty of the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. This is called the Auburn Affirmation. And the Auburn Affirmation, basically what it did, it went on to describe the doctrines that were, well, like the inerrancy of scripture, the virgin birth of Christ, the vicarious atonement, again, Jesus paying for our sins on the cross in our place. Jesus' resurrection, his bodily resurrection, and the miracles of Jesus. The Auburn Affirmation described these things as merely theories about the Bible's message. And within a year, the Auburn Affirmation had secured the signatures of 1,300 Presbyterian ministers. So 1,300 Presbyterian ministers, it's all coming out of New York, but 1,300 ministers basically said, we think all these core doctrines of the faith are optional. In fact, we kind of disagree with them. Um, and we think that we should be able to disagree and still be considered Presbyterian. If you want to find out more about these things, read Machen's Christianity and Liberalism. And again, it, it actually, that book has aged surprisingly well because it's not just about modernism, but it's about these cultural trends that influence the church in negative ways and what the church needs to do, how to stand and defend the gospel. Anyway. Okay, so that's 1923. 1,300 Presbyterian ministers basically said, we're apostates. They signed the Auburn Affirmation. And we're still going to be Presbyterian ministers. You know, they're not stepping down. We think this is consistent with being Presbyterian. So the General Assembly in 1924, right, they, um, they actually were able to dismiss or fire um, Harry Emerson Fosdick from the, the New York City Presbyterian Church. Or at least they removed his credentials and said, you're not welcome in the Presbyterian Church. But, so they, they got rid of Fosdick. He was a Baptist anyway, right? Um, but you know what they failed to do? They had enough votes to get rid of the, the leading figure, one of the leading figures promoting apostasy. But the assembly, it says, failed to take action against the Auburn Affirmations. You still have 1,300 Presbyterian ministers who had basically denied the faith. And the, pre the General Assembly did not do anything about those ministers. So they got rid of the spokesman, Fosdick, but they didn't get rid of the cancer, basically. And that was 1924. Okay, so 1925, there's still all this turmoil in the church, right? You got 1,300 apostate ministers and their allies. And then you have the conservatives who are very concerned that, oh my goodness, our church is apostatizing. What do we do? And so 1925, there's another General Assembly, this time in Columbus, Ohio. Many commissioners were convinced of the creedal infidelity, the apostasy of the Presbytery of New York, right? All these terrible things are coming out of New York. But Henry Sloan Coffin, he was prepared to defend the Presbytery. He was preaching all these sermons, and we say, and basically he's saying, look, we can't call ourselves a Christian church if we exclude from the church's ministry any whom Christ clearly does not exclude from the gift of his Holy Spirit. So Coffin says, look, we can't kick out these Auburn Affirmationist people because they clearly have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So how can we draw lines and exclude them from the church when Christ doesn't do that? You know, because he's clearly given them his spirit. Well, this 1925 assembly then elected Charles Erdman of Princeton Seminary. If you want your hall of villains, Erdman's in it. Why do you 
What's that? One E. One E. That's right. Not like the publishing house Eerdman. It's in Grand Rapids, Michigan, right? Erdman, Charles Erdman, E-R-D-M-A-N. And so the assembly elected Charles Erdman of Princeton Seminary as its moderator. Princeton, who's teaching at Princeton in the 1920s? Anybody? Hodge is not anymore. Uh, Warfield. Warfield is not anymore, 1920s. 1920, 1920s. Oh, okay. So it's 1925. Who's teaching at Princeton besides uh, Erdman? Major. Exactly. Was it Casper Lister Hodge there too? Maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, but Machen's there. Uh, actually, Gerhard's boss is still there too, interestingly. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Um, the assembly elected Charles Erdman of Princeton Seminary. This is still the, the bastion of orthodoxy. This is old school Presbyterianism, right? Hodge, Warfield, the tradition lives on. Um, but Erdman is a teacher there now. So, and Erdman is elected the moderator of the General Assembly, 1925. How did Machen feel about Erdman? Machen considered Erdman to be the candidate of modernists, you know, apostate Presbyterians, and indifferentists. So Erdman was an apostate himself. He didn't embrace the Auburn Affirmation. But what he was is he was, quote, an indifferentist. That is, he thought it's, we shouldn't discipline apostate ministers because it would threaten the ministry of the Presbyterian Church. So he thought going after the cancer, cutting out the cancer, would kill the patient, right? That's really, to put it, Bergman's ideas in the best light. He was an indifferentist. And it said, upon his election as moderator, Erdman quickly proved Machen right about Erdman. He held a two-hour private meeting with Coffin. Uh, remember, Henry Sloan Coffin's the guy that's preaching, hey, we shouldn't discipline anybody and who's an Auburn affirmationist because they have the Holy Spirit. He has a two-hour private meeting with Coffin, in, and he listens to Coffin's plan to lead the Presbytery of New York and its sympathizers out of the assembly should the Judicial Commission rule unfavorably against the Auburn Affirmation people. So Erdman's saying, oh my goodness, we can't have the liberals, the apostates walking now, right? We've got to save the church. So what he did is Erdman, uh, he relinquished his role as moderator temporarily so he could speak. And Erdman proposed from the floor that the assembly, General Assembly, establish a special commission to, quote, study the present spiritual condition of our church and the causes making for unrest and to report to the next General Assembly to the end that the purity, peace, unity, and progress of the church may be assured, unquote. Well, uh, it passed, and Erdman uh, then appointed, because the moderators often have the ability to appoint committees, Erdman appointed 15 committee members, mostly respected loyalists, who again, maybe weren't apostate themselves, but they, they, their attitude was, we can't get rid of the apostates. You know, if we cut out the cancer, it's gonna kill the patient. Or at least threaten the health of the patient. And look, so that was the special commission of 1925. So instead of acting against the Auburn Affirmationists. Erdman proposed, let's have a committee to study this and report back. And then he stacks the committee with people who are Presbyterian loyalists and who are very tolerant of apostasy, even if they are not themselves. Erdman is a villain. I wonder if Erdman, I suspect we won't even see him in glory. How's that? God knows his heart. But he is truly one of the villains. Uh, even if he didn't deny the faith explicitly, he certainly enabled the takedown of the church and the gospel. If he's in glory, he's coming in with... Uh, anyway. Okay, so, uh, so then the commission of 1925 reports back in 1926 to the General Assembly. And in a unanimous report, 
the commission represented or presented its report in 1926, and it agreed with Coffin that there was evangelical unity in the church. American Presbyterianism stood for toleration and progress. And they said the toleration and progress really has two parts to it, according to the commission. One, the Presbyterian system admits to diversity of view where the core of truth is identical. So you can hold two different views on the virgin birth, the inerrancy of scripture, uh, whether Jesus' death on the cross really did do anything to save us, the resurrection of Christ. If you, you could have diversity of views on these questions, they said. And second, the church has flourished best and showed most clearly the good hand of God upon it when it laid aside its tendencies to stress these differences. So the church, when they stress unity, is usually when God blesses them the most, according to this commission. Now, what does that mean? Unity means the Auburn Affirmationists, the apostates, can continue to deny the gospel and to present it as Christian, Christianity and Presbyterianism. That's the unity that they're talking Coffin could not have authored a more agreeable conclusion. It seems to be everyone's wish to keep the peace, he wrote. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So when the commission presented its report in 1926, basically what happened? Um, uh, it was kind of shouted, the conservative dissent was shouted down, they were made to feel like they're mean people. And then in 1927, the General Assembly approved the final report of the commission with only one dissenting vote. The effect was to grant freedom to the Presbytery of New York to reject the virgin birth of Christ as an essential tenet of the church and to vindicate the signers of the Auburn Affirmation. So basically you now have thousands of ministers who are not even believers who deny the faith, and yet they're enabled to continue to teach this and to fill pulpits. Now get this, this is another important thing. The report underscored that Presbyterian unity required the end of all slander and misrepresentation within the church. So the focus of attention then fell on one particular source of recent unrest. The factions within what seminary? Princeton. So you got Erdman, right? And then you have Manchin, among others. But Erdman was the get along. Uh, we can't discipline these people, even if we don't agree with them. You know, we can't kick them out. And Manchin is saying, no, we have to discipline them. This is a completely different religion. <laughs> so that you've got this unrest at Princeton Seminary, as it were. And so what they did, since it's a Presbyterian school, the school was reorganized in 1929, and it brought two signers of the Auburn Affirmation onto its new 30-member board. So now the Board of Trustees of Princeton has two members newly appointed who are apostates. They're signers of the Auburn Affirmation. Convinced that this would lead the school into a decline in theological liberalism, reasonably, Machen left Princeton and started what? Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. That was 1929. So Machen left, uh, there were a number of, uh, no one, I don't think many left with him from Princeton. What he did is he organized the new faculty at Westminster, uh, a lot of Dutch reform guys. Guys, the original faculty was not only Machen, but it was uh, Cornelius Ventil. It was Ned Stoneheis. Stonehouse, really. But Ned Stoneheis. It was R.B. Kuyper. Uh, and so he drew from a lot of Dutch Reform guys to start Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. And they also threw in a Scotchman. What's the guy's name? John Murray. Okay. Unfortunately, Murray is probably the weakest. But anyway, and, and, but anyway that's another story. Um, 
So you've got uh, Machen starting Westminster Seminary in 1929 because the Presbyterian Church basically allowed apostasy to continue and thrive. Was um, Oswald Ellis in there? Yeah, Oswald Ellis, Old Testament. He was a good, good guy. Uh, and Ellis may have left Princeton and to join Machen, I think. Lost did not, curiously. But anyway, nearly two decades later in 1943, the General Assembly of the PCUSA would elect Coffin as moderator, a symbolic vote in two respects. First, it confirmed Coffin's role in the church. So he was not only not disciplined, but later on he's appointed the moderator of the General Assembly. So it affirms him and what he's been doing. Secondly, since he was president of Union Seminary at the time that was apostatizing, the vote represented a healing of the breach between the Presbyterian Church and Union Seminary in the Liberal Presbytery of New York, and ultimately a vindication of Charles Briggs 50 years after his heresy trial. So we see that by 1943, modernism has worked its way throughout and really has gained the most influence in the Presbyterian Church, really marking the end of uh, it's officially when you don't go to the PCUSA because it's apostate. So, uh, questions or comments on the Commission of 1925 about the Auburn Affirmation, about Machen. Machen deserves his own series, as it were. Uh, very, very helpful, but um, we don't have Hart and Mather didn't go into it here. They've written other biographies on Machen which are phenomenal. Defending the Faith uh, by Daryl Hart is outstanding. So, uh, well, no questions or comments then on the Commission 1925. Let's close with prayer and we'll get ready for worship. Uh, let's pray. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the gospel and we thank you for the scriptures that you have preserved throughout the centuries. Uh, Lord, even though our enemy tries to silence it with oppression uh, from without and undermine it with heresy and equivocation from within. Uh, Lord, we always see our adversary trying to, uh, to deceive through uh, by shutting down or changing the gospel. We thank you, Father, that even though uh, the enemy has had significant influence and effects, and victories. Ultimately, Lord, you are sovereign and your victory and your plan is the one that wills out. And so we thank you, Father, for your sovereign plan. We thank you for preserving truth for us so that we could hear, so that we could believe, so that we would have a savior who rescues us from wrath and secures the blessings of your holiness, making us sons and daughters with a great inheritance. We praise you, Father. And we thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for your saving love.